Okay. Okay. So let me just yeah. uh, welcome everyone back and say uh, we discussed last time we're going to have uh, a group of guest lecturers for part of the semester. And uh, thank you. We're delighted tonight to have uh, Professor Peterson going to be here. Just let me give you a brief two hour summary of his recent accomplishments. Um, is one of ours, Cal uh, mechanical engineer, finally turning into PhD level, and then marched up to the academic ranks of the good engineering, which is a professor, full professor of the chair of the department. And now he's also serving administratively as executive associate dean for uh, the college of engineering, which means he's got a lot to do. But uh, that, I don't think, is his passion. I think his passion is what we can hear about tonight. Care is really one of America's most distinguished on nuclear uh, power for civilian purposes. He's an uh, extraordinarily well informed on high temperature reactors and a wide variety of other subjects. He served on Secretary Chu, Secretary Chu's Chu's Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of nuclear energy. And I don't think you could have a better person to do an overview of where we're headed uh, in this very important area. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, I, I enjoy talking on this topic. I can go on forever. I am going to try to finish in uh, by six o'clock or so. So I'll be hitting a number of different topics that relate to civil nuclear energy and that hopefully have some relevance to security and environmental protection, other things that are of interest in this class as well. So um, why, don't, why don't I go ahead and, and, and dive in by, by starting with some contrasting, comparison contrast between nuclear power and other energy sources, because of course that, those comparisons are important in decisions that we'll be making, constraints that we'll have on how it is that we supply energy locally and globally around the world. And the, I think that, that one of the things that we need to think about when we think about energy sources is the broader impacts that they have, not just from the fuel that they consume, but also from the construction materials and the life cycle of, of these energy sources and also their broader impacts and external costs and costs for things such as, as uh, public health and, and environmental impact. Now, when we look at, at different energy sources, the majority of electricity in the world is still generated from coal. Coal, as you saw from the earlier picture, is not a clean energy source. And the quantities that we're using have been growing very rapidly over time. Although it's interesting to note that, that in China, the consumption of coal peaked about a year ago. And hopefully it's going to start to decline as cleaner energy infrastructure ends up being deployed. Now that's quite important because coal is a very intensive emission emitter of carbon, but it also has enormously destructive environmental public health consequences. And anybody who's had the opportunity, for example, to travel to China or India and has experienced air pollution in those countries knows that this is a serious problem. It's one that's solvable because if you've been living here in the Bay Area 30 or 40 years ago, the air quality would have been far worse than it is today. And a set of technological advances, including moving towards cleaner sources of electricity, but also cleaning up automobiles, played a central role in greatly improving air quality in the Bay Area. In particular, the invention of the catalytic converter is really one of the most important things that's happened for public health in the last century. The catalytic converter, uh, if you've had the chance, either when an automobile starts up and runs before the catalytic converter gets heated up, and you smell what's coming out of the exhaust pipe, or to, to, to be behind a car that dates from the, the, the 1970s as well. Imagine every car in the world emitting at that kind of level all of the time, and you know what it was like to live as a kid here in the 1970s, right? So let's go ahead and look at what we might do. It's quite obvious, nuclear power can substitute directly for coal-generated power. They're both 
in their normal design base load uh, operator, they have a fairly high capital cost or fuel costs are low. And so you can substitute nuclear directly for coal, or if you're Germany, you can substitute coal directly for nuclear <laughs> production, correct? So in the United States, future deployment of nuclear power is affected strongly by what's happening with the natural gas and with shale oil and, and also shale gas. And I don't want to go into too much detail here except to point out that the ability to recover oil and gas from shale is one of the more important changes that has occurred affecting U.S. policy. Now, we have some questions as to whether current shale gas prices are lower than they are going to be in the longer term or not. And I think that there's strong evidence that right now that, uh, shale gas is actually far less expensive than it is going to be in the longer term, simply because if we take a look at what's happening with, uh, for example, drilling, um, you can see that, that the, the amount of drilling is very closely related to price. And so this is the curve, this is the most recent version uploaded today uh, from the Energy Information Agency website. And this is the black line is price. You can see back that in 19, uh, in, in, in 2008 time frame, just before uh, the, the, the great part in the, the prices have been observing quite a bit of time. A lot of drilling going on, a lot of vertical well drilling. And then as prices for natural gas came down through 09, we see that the approach to drilling is changing more towards horizontal drilling. And prices stabilized at about $5 a million BTUs. Today, with no oil prices, which drives down shale uh, uh, oil uh, prices and therefore makes it less attractive to drill for shale oil, where natural gas is a byproduct. What we're seeing is a rapid collapse in the number of wells that are being drilled. And so now we have the lowest number of rates operating any time since people started first collecting this data back in 1987. The production of shale gas, therefore, is peak, and it is going to go down. Total production is going to go down because we're not drilling any wells to replace those that are being depleted. So at some point, prices are, are going to happen. People will not start drilling again until the prices go back up. And what will happen with these prices is going to be important in affecting decisions about electricity infrastructure deployment in the United States. Worldwide, natural gas prices are substantially higher on average. And therefore, we have markets that look attractive to uh, deployment of energy sources other than natural gas and light cycle plants. So one of the questions is, well, why is this important? And it relates to, to the, the question of what are the alternatives? And I want to spend a little bit of time looking at wind and solar just to place them into perspective. The issue with wind and solar is that they're not dispatchable, and in fact, under certain conditions, the, the production can actually anti-correlate with load. And this, this is somewhat problematic because it makes it more difficult to integrate these resources. And this is what results in the need for having fossil fuel as backup. So if we, this is an interesting graph that shows during the year of 2015, and there's a researcher, Mark Nelson, who's been studying the uh, production and consumption of electricity in Europe. And this is the average carbon emissions of Germany during 2015 in units of grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. And it's compared with the same production, uh, uh, the, the same carbon emission by the data uh, for France, which is the green curve down here at the bottom. And the French average releases were actually below 50 grams per kilowatt hour. In Germany, what you can see is very, very large variability, which depends a lot on what the mix is in any given hour in terms of coal versus wind. The issue is that if you wanted to take this, these, this sort of production 
and bring it down to the level that you see here in, um, in France, it's going to be very challenging to do. Because this is actually extremely volatile uh, 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 energy source that has substantial intermittency. So we have to be a bit concerned that this may not work very well if we want to get to deep levels of carbon reduction. And in fact, this is the data for Germany over the last five years, from 2011 to 2016. And what you can see is that the carbon emissions have actually not dropped substantially during this entire period. There's been more wind and solar deployed, but they've also been shutting down nuclear plants. And overall, the effect is that they're still covering somewhere around 550 grams per kilowatt hour in terms of carbon emissions. And the question is, you know, how do you bring that trend back down again? So one of the solutions is to have more of your generation uh, produced by sources which can operate as baseload. And this is an important graph that, that provides one of the, the important sort of um, background, factual points about, about nuclear power which is that there's been a large change in how nuclear power plants are operated that occurred dominantly during the 1990s. And so this is a graph, this is, this is the capacity factor of plants versus year in the United States. The, the capacity factor is the percentage of times that plants are running versus what they would do if they ran at their full production all of the time. And so back in the 1970s and 1980s, you can see that the average capacity factors were down in the range of about 60%, which meant that on any given day of the week, maybe two thirds of your plants would be running and one third would be shut down. Something clearly happened in the 1990s, because by the end of the 1990s, you're at a point here where you're at about 90%. And in fact, what's happening here is that about 8% of this time is in refueling outages, which can be scheduled for spring and fall. And the, the forced outage rate has been reduced down to about 2% or so. So the factors, the factors. Changes in the way that plants are operated, mainly from the perspective of things like safety culture, reporting of problems, developing and implementing effective corrective action programs. And I think that the most, the most interesting set of lessons comes from the fact that there was such a, a large benefit in getting more consistent management practices to encourage reporting of problems. And with new regulation, safety regulation, as having many complementary obje uh, 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 objectives as a survival plant population. If you, if you think about things for a second, our human error, the frequency of human errors is low, is going to make the plant run more reliable and it's going to make it generate larger profits. At the same time, these are also things that are important for safety. So what you'd like to see is more general practices where workers are encouraged to report problems, where these problems are entered into corrective action programs and each is addressed systematically, where problems, information about problems is shared with other plants because you're concerned about extent of condition. If something goes wrong, if a plant trips for some reason, and you want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. In addition to fixing the immediate specific problem that caused that trip, you'd like to ask the question, what well, are there other similar things that might happen? And let's say the error involved something like adhering to procedures, right? If we can correct that problem, we might be actually correcting problems that could happen elsewhere. And extended condition shouldn't just be your individual plant. It should include all the other plants in the country. And so having systematic processes in place, which do exist, to share that information with other plants is an important element, ultimately, 
and reducing the frequency with which you have human errors or equipment failures cause problems in plants. And the most important element of getting this to happen is the willingness of employees to actually report problems. Right? Now, think, think about that question for just a moment, because it's a really important question. How do you create an environment that rewards the reporting of problems and honest and trustworthy behavior? And the most important element is that you can't punish people for reporting problems. Right? You need to have a culture that incentivizes that process so that, that, that it's the expectation of an organization that if something's wrong, you will, you will speak out about it. And you'll have processes by which, if you have different professional opinions, they can be resolved and adjudicated in a fair way. But the expectation is that you'll be honest and trustworthy and work with problems. And this contributes to the liability of plants. It also contributes to safety. And now you're thinking about problems with security, right? So now think about the question of classification of information and about uh, uh, security clearances. And ask the question about honest and trustworthy behavior from the perspective of encouraging people to report things and be honest as opposed to concealing them. Because it's equally important within that environment to incentivize honest behavior. And so, for example, if, you, if, if somebody did something silly when they were younger, such as experimenting with substances which are not strictly legal, right? Do you want to have an environment where you know that you should not report that because you'll never get your security clearance? Or do you want to have an environment that encourages those kinds of those kinds of things to be reported on the expectation that people should be honest and trustworthy, right? And open and not lie. Okay, so so this this sort of cultural change is really important element of what has changed here. And the key thing is that it gives us confidence. That if we build new nuclear plants, we can run them reliably and safely, as long as they're designed well, particularly with the newer designs, which have greater simplicity and intrinsic safety. But that doesn't mean that we're going to build a lot of them, because if it's too expensive, it's just not going to happen, particularly because it's unlikely that we're ever going to place a tax on carbon that is really sufficient to internalize all of the costs associated with use of fossil fuels. So the better option is to try to make nuclear cheap, as cheap as you can while making it safe, secure, and so on. And what do we need in order to do that? Well, a first really uh, important point to look at is what about the cost of fuel? And today, the cost of the uranium and the enrichment and the fuel that you use to produce nuclear electricity with light water reactors is about half a cent per kilowatt hour, which is a pretty small fraction of the total production cost. The question then is, is that going to become expensive any time in the near term? And the basic consensus is that we have several decades before we're likely to see uranium prices increase greatly. So the near-term objectives, if you're interested in making nuclear energy affordable, really don't involve greatly improving the efficiency with which you use uranium. It's not going to change the price or the cost of, of, of um, nuclear electricity very much. And you're probably curious what this is a big, what this what this figure is. So this is uranium and soil in the United States, and believe it or not. Back in the 1970s, we actually had a systematic program to fly airplanes at low altitude across the entire United States with sensitive radiation detectors, and some people are working on similar things these days, to measure radiation coming from the autos of the decay of, of uranium and to figure out how much uranium there is in the soil, and then with some localized sampling to get that figure out. And this is it, by parts per million. And you can see that there's some areas like the, the northeast, uh, or the, 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 the northwest, where the northwest and the northeast, or I guess, oh, yeah, no, this is the um, <laughs> mid, upper midwest, uh, which are clearly deficient in terms of their, their uh, uranium, soil uranium loading. There's other places which have an abundance of it, 
And then if you go here and look right here, this is Berkeley. And if you go here, you'll see Berkeley is at 1.8 parts per million. Believe it or not, that is exactly the national average. And so Berkeley is exactly as average uh, in terms of how radioactive we are. Right? Which is the only way Berkeley is average. So that is, <laughs> that, is, that is an interesting fact that you can tell all of your friends uh, when you're having your visa. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing is that that translates sort of the top yard of soil. Uh, every square mile has about six tons of uranium in it. So this is this is a ubiquitous substance. Let me go on to, to then some things that relate more to, to what the real cost drivers are for current nuclear power, and that's, that's the construction cost or capital cost. And there's a variety of different ways of looking at uh, uh, construction. And in the life cycle sense, people study the material inputs that are needed to build stuff. And I've spent a fair amount of time just looking at these numbers because I've been really puzzled trying to figure out what's going on with the cost of building the power plant. And concrete and steel are interesting things because they actually constitute over 95% of construction inputs. And uh, therefore, um, they're actually easy to estimate because you can, you can get the numbers by looking at arrangement problems and stuff. And since they're 95% of all the material that goes in, they're, they're also directly relevant to things like life cycle of carbon emissions. So nuclear, uh, if you look at the average megawatt power output, that is adjusted to reflect the operating capacity factor, uh, you could construct in the 1970s at about 40 megatons of, uh, of steel per megawatt of power output, 90 cubic meters of concrete. For those who are interested, the AP1000, and I can't reveal my source, but the AP1000 is probably about double this. So if you just double all the steel numbers, it, 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 there's, there's a set of reasons why. And then the EPR is yet, yet much larger amount. Um, when, Wind turbines, you can see here 460 metric tons of steel per megawatt and 870 cubic meters of concrete, about 10 times as much material to build. Coal plants, actually, this is this is roughly double the amount of steel, double the amount of concrete. It makes you question why you would build coal plants and why it is that they could be cheaper than nuclear plants. Natural gas combined cycle plants, you see the numbers are very small. And this, this is actually, this is one of the, the, the reasons why natural gas combined cycle plants are so affordable with natural gas is inexpensive, is that, that the plants themselves are easy and inexpensive to build. And this just puts it on the graph. So another calculation that I did some time ago was then to ask, well, is it commodity prices that are driving the cost of nuclear electricity? And this was back in 2008 when commodity prices were skyrocketing. And there was this question, there was a statement saying that, well, it's the high cost of commodities that's making nuclear energy expensive. And if you go through this calculation and take the prices back in 2008, multiply them through, you conclude that the commodity cost is about $36 uh, per kilowatt of, of uh, capacity, which out of the $5,000 that you have to pay today is less than 1%. And so, so the raw material inputs are not what's driving the cost. There are other factors, and there's some really good work being done, for example, by Jessica Lovering and the Brainerd Institute, trying to explain what drove up costs during the, the first build cycle in the United States and why in other countries, for example, Japan and South Korea, these costs are coming down. Understanding these factors is really important in trying to figure out how to fix nuclear power. Because if we continue to do it the way we've done it in the past, it will remain too expensive. Whoever figures out how to do it better, it is going to literally change the world because there is room for disruptive improvement in terms of how we design and build nuclear power plants. But they, they, given if, if your commodities are only 1% of the total input, there's room for improvement. And let me, you know, it, this shows a lack of improvement, but you also had a big effect occurring in like 1979, which was, 
Three mile on the last one, right? Mm -hmm. And operating licenses were greatly delayed. And if you have delays in construction, that can be very expensive, right? And so if you dig into and tease into this numbers, there's some uh, there's a very good recent paper out of our on National Lab that really points towards labor productivity as being a major factor. So here's a much more recent calculation with more recent commodity prices. This takes that generation two pressurized water reactor and if you double the steel, then this is maybe 1,000 droplet. Uh, it compares it with a Vestas wind turbine and with a Chevy Island. Right? <laughs> now, the, the key thing here to notice is that the total amount of commodity cost for nuclear is only inflated to $37 a kilowatt. The wind turbine is at $540 per kilowatt, so clearly Vestas is has better ability to convert steel, concrete, and copper into wind turbines than Westinghouse House has to take those same materials and deliver you uh, nickel power plants. In fact, Westinghouse charges you about 10 times as much to take materials and build wind turbines and build nuclear plants on them as best as us. Or for that matter, you can see that the cost to, 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 to take steel and rubber and other things and build automobiles is much closer to the wind turbine numbers than it is the nuclear numbers. This is, this, is, this is a really serious problem. And the question is, what have we done wrong and how do we fix it going forward? Well, one of the things that we've been looking at is how to use modular construction, take advantage of more modern methods such as computer-aided design. Uh, this, is, this is early, now this is, this is uh, cruise ships, amazingly, a billion dollar class cruise ship can be assembled in under a year in a shipyard these days using modular construction methods. In the 1980s and 90s, the Japanese were also making, already making fairly major improvements in how to, to apply modularization to construction, which is what is allowed them to get their construction grades down to four to five years. That's still way too long. But at least it's better than the eight to ten years. Or in the case of EPR that's been constructed in Finland, it's still not operating for between year 12 in the construction process for that finished EPR. It's still not, still not operational. Moving towards more modular construction using steel plate concrete composites is also an interesting direction to go because you can move more of your work into a factory setting. The other thing that's interesting from a security perspective is that, that these structures are much more ductile. So if you're driving, if you're down around the MacArthur maze and you look at where things have been retrofit, one of the things to look for is the columns on those bridges. They have steel jackets around them. And the back that involved putting these jackets around and then filling that space with concrete because what those jackets do is, is when you drive those columns past the last of limits and you start to crack the concrete, the conventional reinforced column, if you ever seen pictures of a collapsed bridge or something, the conventional reinforced column, the, the concrete just falls away. And you rapidly lose your ability to carry the compressive load. And then the whole thing collapses. And as soon as you have the jacketing, you can find that you can actually suffer substantial deformation and still maintain capacitary load, which is ductile behavior. And this is really good in terms of performance, for example, for aircraft impact. One interesting just tidbit, because everybody's really excited about and justifiably how high the tuition is in the UC system, right, uh, for students. Well, an interesting tidbit about uh, state investment is that, that um, uh, much of what we look at in terms of our structural deficit, you can actually trace back to major expenditures to upgrade buildings to meet seismic standards because we have a particularly hazardous area. And the, 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 the loan, the basically the, 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 the mortgage that we're carrying right now, the, the loan payments on that are almost exactly Big earthquake uh, recently because the, the, the last one when when the, the in Bayer in that moment we had an earthquake 
The part of, of uh, 880 that collapsed, that doubled that part, was exactly the part where the state had run out of money and it stopped doing that bit. And 50 people died. If it hadn't been the World Series, everybody knows there would a lot more. And so, the, and then after that, well, this, you had this burst of there was a few years of a state economy and then it, it stopped. And the, the sad thing is that the most likely earthquake to happen is the one that's going to happen right here on the Hayward Fault, right? And it will be too late for us to get the state to help us out in terms of this. And, and I think we're making prudent decisions to go ahead and replace Coleman Hall regardless of that. We don't have to do how we're going to pay for it. Right. That's just an aside. Okay. So um, let's go ahead. This is this is 81,000 structural modules being fabricated. In uh, uh, China, we learned that in the United States, we lost a lot of our capacity to do manufacturing competently because all of the major delays in trying to build similar AP1000s in the United States have occurred because the plant that was built in Lake Charles, Louisiana, had serious quality and, and delivery problems. And they were principally responsible for the lack of capability to do manufacturing competently. Was principally responsible for most of the delays in building these plants in the United States. And then these large structural modules are welded together, set in place. It works quite nicely. Here are some pictures from the global side in the United States. Very impressive, large structures and stuff. The issue is that when you suffer delays with large plants like this, there's no electricity being generated. So one of the questions is how do we fix that problem, perhaps by building smaller plants in larger numbers? that can be brought online more rapidly and start generating electricity so you have some revenues, and so on and so forth. Let me next do a quick diversion to look at physical security and non-proliferation. Let me make a really high level point about the goals of safety, the goals of physical security, and the goals of, of international safeguards. And in all cases, we're interested in, in how it is we design systems where we can maintain knowledge and control of where materials are, right? where we put materials on. So if we're doing things well and we're thinking about physical security, international safeguards, and safety simultaneously at the beginning of the design process, we're more likely to make good decisions in how to do that. We also can begin to apply very similar uh, uh, assessment methods in order to, to assess the reliability of performance. So when we think about safety, we use scenario-based approaches where we identify initiating events, we look at how the system responds, we look at what the consequences are. This is the basic framework for risk assessment. We actually do very similar things when we look at physical security and we look at non-proliferation is pathways-based methods where we identify threats, we see what the system response might be, we look at the outcomes, we assess whether this is acceptable, and then we modify the system design in order to fix so that we get acceptable consequences. Now, uh, it's a really good idea to think about these things at the earliest stages of design, because one makes decisions very early on and important. For example, flow diagrams. And you know, in, in France, uh, they have a, a, a fuel cycle that relies on chemical separation of plutonium into highly purified forms that can be placed in the canisters that can be direct contact handled. And then, for various reasons, they decided to cite the, the processing plant in the north of France. And the fuel fabrication plant in the southernmost part of France. So that therefore they actually had to transport this direct use plutonium from the north part of France to the southern part of France. Okay. That was that that set of decisions sort of they sort of locked themselves into a system that's going to give that, that requires really stringent physical protection uh, measures, right? And so you can think about options to design systems which may be intrinsically more robust than that uh, going forward in the future. Um, and so the basic the basic point is that safety proliferation exists in physical protection. These are these are attributes of systems where you if you design them properly you can have linear elements achieved by complementary or synergistic methods. Inevitably 
there will also be uh, there will also be conflicts between these goals. And so, if you think about it early enough in the design of these systems, the nice thing is that you can, where you identify conflicts, you can try to design them out of the system or so that the conflicts are reasonable. Let me give a few specific examples. For example, in the area of emergency response. Um, in emergency response, there's clear conflicts between what you want for safety, which is easy egress, right, compared to uh, what you want for physical security, which is to restrict and control access and egress, correct? Now, one of the nice things about reactors that are designed to have safety, like say AP-1000, is that the equipment that performs these functions is actually located in places that are difficult to get access to deliberately because it doesn't require external sources of power. And when these heat exchangers heat up, they get hot and they're hazardous. And so the equipment that provides, say, shutdown in AP-1000 is all inside the container, right? In our Generation 2 plants, the equipment that provides safe shutdown and cooling of fuel is all outside of containment in areas that are easy to get physical access to. And that means that our existing nuclear plants are intrinsically more difficult to, sit, to, to, to protect because equipment that if you damage it uh, could cause fuel damage, that, that equipment is located outside of the containment. And the new plant design, we don't need to do that. The reason passing, if you're looking at reprocessing, reprocessing like a pyro reprocessing and stuff that is performed inside of hot cells and where the fuel is fabricated inside hot cells because it's sufficiently radioactive, it's got minor actinides in it, that it would be difficult, hazardous to handle. There's nothing better than a hot cell from the perspective of physical security because it looks a lot like a bank vault. In fact, bank vaults are designed so that you can go in and out of them easily. And in hot cells, we don't do that. People don't go inside it, right? So you can see that depending on the technology you select, you can make physical security easy or difficult. And that's, that's an important thing to be thinking about. Um, human performance. The, the, the people that do security and the people that do safety really should talk about human performance stuff because there's essentially 100% overlap when you look at, at what the things are that you want to do. You know, for example, uh, background checks on employees. You do that for safety because you want people who are not lying about their phones and stuff. You do it for physical security because you don't want people who might uh, uh, be terrorists or things about it. You have access control, tamper evidence, and concealed. Two man rules are used to reduce human error frequency for uh, safety. So some procedures for safety purposes will, will actually have two man rules, and we do that for physical security as well. Supervisor observations and worker behaviors and stuff, all of these things are complementary. Um, quality assurance. All the things that we do within quality assurance to make sure that things are built and operated the way that they were supposed to be in the original design are good for security, for safety. Uh, international safeguards, a major element of what IAEA does during the construction of this uh, facility is to verify that it's being built the way it was designed and that you're not putting in a secret extra pipe, you know, that could transfer stuff in and out. So there's actually a, a, a large synergistic uh, 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 element here. The application of probabilistic risk assessment, you can systematically identify trends that have to initiate events. There's clear uh, synergy because we can also use this, these methods to assure that safeguard systems will have high reliability so that we won't get uh, false alarms or situations where IAEA is unable to verify absence of diversion and so on. So, uh, as you can see, if we think about safety, physical security, international safeguards in a synergistic way, which is what we're trying to teach nuclear engineering students to do, then we can end up with systems that are intrinsically easier. So what might those systems look like in my remaining 10 minutes? 
Well, at some point we'll move uh, uh, past the current generation two power plants. Uh, we're building generation three and three plus, uh, things like the AP 1000 picture here. And generation four is where we make the step away from water as a coolant to alternative coolants. I'm going to try to move a little more quickly here. Uh, let me see. So, so basically, in the near term, we're going to see large advanced light water reactors. In the longer term, there's this explosion of innovation that's happening in the nuclear sector. It's now over 50 startup companies of various different size, ranging from uh, a sort of your busting house and your general economics down to, to things that are much smaller, like their new powers and stuff. And actually, they even put, they even put Berkeley on this list as well, which, which is good. This, 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 is, this is sort of a new phenomenon, and it's going to be interesting to see what, what comes out of it in a decade time frame. One of the ways of looking at what's possible is to go back a decade before now and look at where the United States was, which we developed this, this, uh, 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 this, this thing called the space shuttle, which ended up being very problematic in its performance. And there's just sort of a number of major flaws in the architecture. And then you also can see, you know, right now the French are, the, the Ariba cannot disengage from this European pressurized reactor, even though there's not even any, they, they started construction 12 years ago and there's not even one yet functioning, right? And so, so the, this question of what is it that locks you into technologies that clearly have problems is one of the key things we have to address. How do we, how do we break that mold? And so, you know, a set of design issues, you may have, you know, for example, how do your, 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 um, uh, your crew ride along the, the cargo is, is a problem. So ultimately, uh, the lifetime cost over its life cycle, we spent $60,000 per kilogram of stuff that was delivered in orbit by the space shuttle. Even once we fully depreciate and we have the money as well as they could, just the variable cost to do another launch was $16,000 per kilogram. And then you look at today, where uh, the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program at NASA encouraged a whole bunch of flighty startup companies to try to build rockets. And you got a few of them that were actually successful and wildly, wildly successful. So today, um, Musk will charge you $16 per kilogram. And then you've got this remarkable thing here. Look at this. You take off, and then you land back down the ground. Right? And they actually have done this successful only once so far. But they, they made the they made sort of the, 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 the random more reliably in the future. This is a huge accomplishment because in a conventional rocket, this is the this is this is the majority of the cost is throwing away this piece of equipment every single time. If you can depreciate this piece of equipment over 10 to 20 launches, that completely changes the game in terms of that $4,600 per per kilogram number. And it enables you to think about doing things in space that would never we just have seen laughable otherwise. You may even go to Mars at this, you know, at this point just because it's affordable to get the equipment you need up into the upper orbit. Imagine if we could take nuclear power and reduce its cost by a factor of 10 from what it is today. And what that would imply about the world as well. And to do it in a way where the, the, the technology was still safe, secure, uh, and so on. So how, well, um, the first thing is that you really need to have a whole bunch of really bright and capable students who are willing to invest themselves to work on this, on this problem, try to figure out how is it that we do this? How, how do we achieve this? I think that there's three, these are three high level key things that we need to move forward on. One, one is to, to essentially transition to a point where all the actors are designed with passive safety. That is, when you shut them down, uh, the, the, the removal of heat and the control of reactivity is done without the need of for any external sources of power uh, or external heat sink. In fact, the way that you activate these systems as you go under 8,000 is you actually remove DC power 
you remove instrument error, you remove instrumentation controls, and the shutdown state is one that's safe. And that's very different from the Gen 2 plants, where if you do that, the shutdown state is what we saw for the Shima. Right? Okay. So uh, smaller reactors so that you can build them in larger numbers is, I think, critical element. It may not be the global solution. China certainly can build a lot of really big reactors. But this is where you begin to learn. And also, if you can figure out how to do this well, where new scale is doing a lot of important work, it gives you a much lower activation barrier for them to find reactors, developing the point reactors that use alternative coolants. And a lot of our interest has been in looking at systems that would use molten salts. So, um, there, there's a number of things that suggest that the economies of scale can be reversed, particularly. Passive safety simplifies reactors sufficiently that it really is practical to scale them down in size. And so the one of the things is that, that the cost to build a single unit drops a lot. So from the perspective of the amount of capital that you need to place at risk, it's reduced also. And this has a lot to do with financing the demonstration of the new design and also just financing the construction of the new plant. Um, you can also do the use of that. The big issue that we face, though, is a company like NewScale. When NewScale, for example, figures out the control room problem, they have 12 modules in their design, all of them really small. And if they complied with current NRC regulations, they'd have to have 48 operators in their control room which would be absolutely insane for a 500 megawatt net station. So they come up with a very beautifully designed control room that uses six operators. If they license that design, there's nothing to prevent their competitors from free riding on that decision. Right? And free riding is one of the market failures that causes underinvestment and that creates disincentives for first movers. There's sort of a famous quote attributed to a utility executive, I don't know who it would have been, but basically saying that his goal in life, in his business decisions, is he firmly wanted to always be number two. Right? <laughs> and unfortunately, if you have an industry where everybody wants to be number two, you're not going to see anybody moving into the number one spot. This is why it's logical for us to subsidize new scale and to caution the development, because that's that's a that's a logical basis by which you would provide subsidies. The current the current production tax credits that we have for wind and solar don't have that same logic associated with them, but there's certain ways that you can design subsidies that actually correct market failures and this is a good example of the first mover failure. Okay. At this point I'm I, I'm supposed to wrap up and to to um, to take questions and I'm going to do that faithfully which means that you won't hear me talking a, a lot about my favorite reactor design. <laughs> unless unless you uh, come to my research group meetings and then we spend a lot of time talking about it. But I'll just point out we're working on molten salt reactors. They're very, very interesting because the temperature range where we can make these reactors work uh, is at cool, with coolant temperatures in the six to 700 degree range. The fuel has thermal limits above 17 to 1800 degrees centigrade, the 40 degree centigrade reactor material. And the peak temperatures that you can reach during accidents are vastly lower than this. And this means that this is this is a class of reactors where, interestingly enough, accidents don't result in core damage and result in damage outside of the core. And we're focused on very, very different safety metrics because of the fact that, that steel, our steel boundaries will melt at temperatures below the temperature uh, where, where the fuel will fail. So we've come up with designs and stuff for how to make these things work. What we find results 
is that they have very high volume of heat capacity. This means that the reactors end up being, when you design them, much more compact than either sodium cooled or helium cooled reactors are. And one of the most recent insights that we're taking from that and looking at these sort of scanning uh, parameters is to, to note that if you if you build a reactor that uses molten salt, you're probably going to end up using one quarter to one tenth the amount of material it would take to build a power plant with the same power output that's using sodium as food. So why not? design that reactor system to have a limited service line. Say so only 10 years because it's small, it's fairly compact, make it replaceable. And as soon as you a space where your high temperature components that run under severe thermal and radiation conditions can be replaced instead of having you know, having it convince people that they'll run reliably for 60 years, it completely changes that. It's a really interesting area of design space to be in, and it's one of the ones that I think has that potential to be disruptive. That is to allow you to, to do something about this factor of 10, difference in cost, right? And also to do something about construction schedule and development schedule as well. And so it'll be interesting to see if we can do that and whether someday you're going to see, I don't know if it looks exactly like this, but power stations where you've got multiple modules of dry salt fuel and temperature reactors coupled to air braking, combined cycle, power conversion, and so on and so forth. And with that, I think I'm going to stop and take any questions. I'll start. Um, have you have you looked at the the Russian and Chinese state-owned and what are their approaches? Are there any approaches that we should copy, and are there any approaches that we should just run away from? That's a really really good question. So, boy, where where to start with the answer? I I think that that the United States, in some sense, is in a unique position. We're the only country that doesn't develop our civil nuclear energy infrastructure using state-run corporations. And we have, we're in a fundamentally better position to be able to be innovative. The, the incumbent companies really have a difficult time making good decisions. I mean, that's why you ended up with the space shuttle, right? And, and the space shuttle, there's no logic in using Hydrogen is a fuel for first stage. In fact, the Saturn V was kerosene, right? The performance benefits of hydrogen emerge for second stage and stuff, and there's a variety of technical reasons for that. But it turns out that hydrogen as a first stage makes a lot of sense if you want to strap on, which of course is a part of the space shuttle. Why would you want to strap on solid rocket boosters onto your rockets? Well, solid rocket boosters are developed for missiles, right? Because it's a big benefit for intercontinental missiles to have solid fuel instead of having to sit around with them filled with volatile and dangerous alternative fuels. Well, if you've got a big, if the government needs to have the capability to build these kind of boosters and you're not using a lot of these missiles, well, what are you going to do? Well, you'll Put them, you'll just strap them on your space shuttle, and now you've got business for your solid rocket booster people, and, and everything looks great from the perspective of, of a government. But it's not clear that that's what you should do if you want to make space launch cheap and affordable. So, so on, on the Chinese and Russian side, I, I, I think that, 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 especially on the China side, the, the collaboration with the United States is has had and will continue to have major impact. Of course, we have cooperation with the China Institute of Applied Physics in the area of the molten salt technologies. The AP1000, which is the only large light water reactor that you can buy today that actually has passive safety uh, implemented, the, the, the AP1000 would not exist today 
if it hadn't been for the joint development and demonstration with China and the United States. If the Chinese had not taken on the construction of the coast, we would have never gotten it before. So, so I think that maybe what we want to think about is, is opportunities for us to play on the strengths of all of the countries um, to accelerate the deployment. And there's a lot of, uh, I was just at a workshop with, with James Hansen and and uh, Richard Bester and some other people in, in China where we're discussing this question of cooperation to address climate change problems. And for sure, for sure, I think there's large opportunities for the U.S. and China to potentially do even more than they've done already. Our relationship with Russia is much more complex, and also with the Russians, Russians are just different when it comes to their approach to taking the risk in the nuclear field, and I'm not sure that we're really going to be able to to engage productively with them, because I don't think they'll see our, our goals for safety along nearly as closely as they can be with China. Yes. yes. So maybe ask me to go into a little more detail about how this aligns our thing and what ways. So, which are, which, for example, safety goals with the um, United States and the Russian nuclear team. Uh, what are the sort of disagreements there? So, so. That's a difficult question. The, the, the Russian approach to safety has changed a lot. Um, after, after the Chernobyl accident, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were large exchanges uh, where we sent US experts, technical experts, to support people in the, in the former Soviet countries and stuff to try to adopt more, uh, uh, more US There's a number of stories that you hear about the way things have been done in Russia, at least historically, that give you pause. And I think, for example, I had mentioned the importance of the quality assurance. So as an engineer, if you design a system to be safe, that you think it's going to be safe, you're making the presumption that it's going to be built the way you design it, correct? This is, this is a really important assumption the engineers need to recognize that it is not guaranteed to happen, right? And there's there's two dimensions to, to that. The first is engineers need to be realistic about what you can really do in terms of construction. It is very common for engineers to design things that cannot be fabricated. And this is one of the reasons why if you work in my lab, uh, you're, you're going to be told to go get trained in the machine shop. Right? No matter whether you're going to do simulation or whatever, it's it's a part of understanding what it is you really can build. This is a critical element of this uh, of this process. And, and then, the, the, but the next part is that question, the expectation: How do you confirm that it was built the way it was supposed to be built? And the anecdote, and I don't know whether it's true, but the anecdote that I heard for Russia was that the civil engineer would figure out how much structural steel they wanted to put in for reinforcing the concrete wall or something like that. And then on the assumption that less would be used in the actual construction, would double the number in order to make sure that they had at least as much as they thought was necessary actually installed. I do not know whether this story is true, but it is an important lesson in, in terms of why quality assurance is, is important and diligence in doing that well. The thing I have to explain is that, that quality assurance is the largest headache you can have if you're working. It, it, it requires a lot of additional work. And actually, the students in the TH lab know this because we have a quality assurance program and, and it, it increases the amount of work that you have to do. So, in, in, in any rate, um, with respect to the cooperation, I, I think that right now probably the better opportunities exist with countries that are deploying Western origin technology, which is dominantly US, uh, Asia, Japan, South Korea, China, uh, in terms of, of doing things that can, can be more transformational in terms of the economy. Can you put all of the three writer so, whoever uses the technology license, then they get paid for that license. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> There's certain things that you can't license for patent. So, the NRC regulatory decision, you can't patent that. If the NRC concludes, oh, we're willing to approve a 
control room configuration for multi module <coughs> that has less staff than they required before. That's that's not something that you can pack. Now you might try to pack the features in the control room, but those can be worked around almost certainly. And so addressing that basic question, which for the first mover is success or failure, because you're never going to see small module or multi module like a plant deployed if the control room staff room has to be a factor for one of the modules. It's just not going to happen. So, so that, that means that, that New Scale is betting a billion dollars on this question of whether or not the NRC would actually approve their approach to the control room. Because they'll never build any of these plants if, if, if they don't get the correct answer. And everybody can free ride on their billion dollar wager. Now, this points towards another thing that we or people are looking at in terms of regulatory reform, which is that, that if you go and look for other industries where there is far more frequent and effective innovation within areas where technologies is heavily regulated, and actually, believe it or not, for SpaceX, you, you, you get something on a launch range and you get it up into the air. And to qualify it to carry humans or to carry cargo is not a trivial thing in terms of the regulatory requirements. Same applies to commercial aviation. Same applies to biotech. And in biotech, the FDA is great because the FDA actually has a phased licensing process that is set up deliberately so that you can address the simplest and most fundamental questions early in the process. And therefore, your investment decision has these key decision points where you, you have the option to drop off of the uh, or to continue. And the conventional approach for licensing the power plants, unfortunately, is that, that um, the NRC will tell you they want you to submit a complete and final license application, and then they'll review it. And this is, this is, this is just not a great business model if you're trying to do anything that is substantially innovative. But you can fix that. Moose Camp did that. Uh, it, 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 I pointed out that our operating act was actually on the operating side, things were very really well. And on the operating side of plants, the NRC is actually much more capable and competent at regulating and operating plants because they had continuous experience. And they developed this sort of, they, they, you know, everybody's kind of recognized that encouraging problems to be reported is a good idea because but you have to make it possible to fix the problem. So if you compare and contrast the way the NRC views operating plants in terms of identifying and fixing problems, compared to the way they view the construction plants, where they've been taking very prescriptive compliance, build it exactly the way you said you would, and if you deviate at all, we will punish you severely by like delay of the construction. This is, this is not the right way to develop and deploy new plants. Now, the, the vendors can be a fair amount also, I think, to figure out how to better manage these risks. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, current, the current model doesn't work that way. And, and so but going back to the free rider problem, it, it really is about the fact that there's certain things that you can't protect once you solve the problem. It sounds like it made an ad comparison where the advisory companies can then price their products. Yeah. Right. So that's the other problem with it. I'm not guaranteed the ability to price the energy output. It's um, also subject. You can't mark it up to yeah. compensate for the investment that you put in. Right. I mean, biotech is doing is you're creating a new drug or a new medical device that has some unique new benefit to it that the previous technology couldn't do. Right. And and you're you're absolutely correct. One of the big issues with with, with nuclear is that it's just another way to make electricity. Right? So this is one of the reasons why we've actually invested a fair amount of effort looking at this nuclear air mine cycle. Because it has the capability to produce peaking power, also you can cope by that with gas. And with very high thermal efficiency, you can rapidly boost your power up, up and down on top of the nuclear base load. And when you look at that from the perspective of, of sort of economics model and revenue, the revenue goes up enormously if you have capability to do that. 
And so people have been looking at are there alternative products that we can produce. I, I think one of the things to be watching in the coming decade is whether whether there is serious efforts to do deep water fluid and deep water plants that would co-generate these automated water. Because that's that's another area where you can have a sort of transformational impact on the because literally the entire planet is built in shipyard and it's totally out of the moor to have the kind of kilometers of control, which is fairly close compared to what we typically do in the offshore wind part of infrastructure these days. So, so and then, then you can you can co generate desalinated water because you're pumping large amounts of water, ocean water through your cooling systems anyhow. So so this is this is one of the options. That's a really, really, really good question. Uh, you break it into the sort of two, two basic parts. Uh, the first is that, that I do think that there are problems with the current framework by which we distribute this from the regulator, the public, the plant operator, the reactor vendor. The, the warranty that the reactor vendor will give you for a large advanced light like water reactor is really important. When you look at, at how much risk is being transferred to the customer, if the customer really is not in the strongest position to manage, but you can also understand why with these really large plants, the, the, um, the, the vendor has a difficult time warranting it as well, and that's why governments, you, you, you see these things being deployed in the environments where there's very certain support government policies. The capability to have the accidents that have a large offset consequence is really an artifact to have a decided to deploy the actors first and so on. Because the most large footprint is water, and water is unique among the major cooling options that, that in severe accidents where you manage fuel. The cesium and the iodide hit the ones that are volatile. And so, so they can mobilize the small aerosol particles and then that, that's the reason you need a high pressure low leakage containment as as and you know, the boundaries for safety. But I, I think that the the, the external costs. If we think about those those parts of the risk, such as the price in our center or, or the severe accident risk or that sort of thing, is if we just do that, let's let's just compare that external cost to the external cost of other things that the economy is bringing to. Okay. And and when you perform the calculation looking at the typical numbers, for example, for fossil fuels. What you conclude is we need to have, you know, in the United States about you know, two or three channels per year, and then we'd be starting to get close to matching the public health and environmental impacts that we have to pull. When you go to Germany, and Germany every every year is evacuating villages and bulldozing and permanently altering the local ecosystem because of their strip mining activities. And from Google Earth, what they're doing is Oh, what are they doing right, with this? And somehow they, they, you know, there's this lack of, of, of ability to sort of is there any commonality between what we're doing as a matter of national policy and mining very much coal where they have to get Fukushima in terms of displacing people, in terms of causing environmental damage. And, and, and so this is, the, I think this is the, 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 the sort of the crux of the question. But, Ultimately, I think what we've learned is that severe reactor accidents, no matter what the math says, uh, are enormously disruptive. And we do need to, to transition as rapidly as we can to technologies that make those kinds of accidents either impossible or, or much less likely to occur. And one of the, one of the immediate steps is to move towards deploying reactors that incapacitate. They, they do not have the kinds of failures that are caused with the advantage of the future. And then the longer term, smaller reactors, and then 
moving is seriously trying to move the water to the Okay, I think at this point probably um, you've got a sort of a, a, a social gathering with new prospective students and stuff that I know some of the new course students are going on to and stuff. So I, I was like, thank you, I enjoyed the opportunity to speak. I thank Michael um, Mott for inviting me and uh, look forward to seeing you all again, uh, hopefully, at other days in the future. Thank you. No, it's not. It's, it's a